Hello everyone, it's Chris from Military Aviation History and I'm at the RAF Museum in London. And this is of course a great place to have a look at some of those classic aircraft from World War I, World War II and into the Cold War period. So you know what, while we're here, why don't we pop inside and see what we can find. Today we are looking at the Curtis P-40N or as it was known to the British and Commonwealth forces, the Kitty Hawk 4. This exhibit is one of 13 P-40 wrecks recovered in 1947 from New Guinea and restored in the United States. At the end of the walk around, I will also talk more about the object's history, but for now, let's get started. First, the basics. The P-40 is a single-seat, all-metal, low-wing monoplane designed for medium-altitude pursuit and interception of hostile aircraft. The aircraft is 10.1 meters in length, 3.8 meters in height, and it spans 11.4 meters. Up front, a prominent three-bladed propeller. This would have been a Curtis Electric constant speed propeller with a high pitch of 54.5 degrees and a low pitch of 24.5 degrees. Right now, the aircraft does not seem to have the original propeller. Easy to see from the front, the cooler inlet set below the prop spinner. Having a closer look, you can see the partition into three separate coolers. The top two are the glycol radiators, the lower, the oil cooler. Manually adjustable cowling gills are set behind the radiators. The engine is a liquid-cooled 12-cylinder V-shaped Allison V1710-81. This is an improved version of the previous Allisons by being compacter in size but with a higher output. At max power, it puts out 1200 horsepower at 3000 RPM. It has a single-stage, single-speed supercharger. This engine operates best with the aircraft kept under 15,000 feet but the manual also warns that the automatic manifold pressure regulator tended to run into issues beyond 12,000 feet. On each side of the cowling, you will find six individual exhaust stacks of the filtered air intake. This intake would usually be used during taxi in tropical and dusty conditions. On top of the engine cowling, you will see the actual carburetor air intake used in flight. Running along the length of this intake, you will find the location of the glycol tank for the engine cooling and the oil tank. They are set just in front of the firewall. The left access door is for the starter brush, the right one for the engine oil filter. An access door for the starter crank might have been lost during the renovation. Between the rudimentary backup side and the armored windscreen, you will find the filler caps for the glycol and oil tank. Moving then to the starboard wing. As you will have noticed, it is a dihedral wing set at 6 degrees. The wing covers 236 square feet. The first obvious feature is the bulbous gear strut housing close to the wing root. We will have a closer look at this later. Second, about a third along the length of the leading edge, we find the armament consisting of six 50 cal Browning machine guns. Early P-40 versions were armed with a mixture of 30 and 50 cal, but with the P-40D, the plane standardized to use only 50 cal. Initially, four were used, then six. You can see an artifact of this upgunning by looking below the wing. You will see that the inboard gun is offset on the gun access door by looking at the casing dispensers. This was to facilitate an easier ammunition feed into the gun. Speaking of ammo, the standard loadout gave the pilot 235 rounds per gun, which allowed for about 10 seconds of continuous fire. In overload, each gun would have an additional 46 rounds. The P40N15 we see here did not have a manual gun charger for the pilot if the gun jammed, but overall, the feeding system in the aircraft was a good one. As the guns fire outside the propeller arc, a synchronization gear is not required. The large plate next to the guns cover the bomb rack mounting point. Another access hatch can be found close to the wingtip. 
to check the wiring of the wingtip lighting. The green navigational light is set both above and below the wing. On the upper surface we have two large doors allowing access to the ammunition boxes. Small port covers allow for adjustments to the gun alignment. A cover below the ammo supply is to gain access to the aileron control. Although the aircraft is all metal, the aileron itself is covered in canvas. The flaps are simple split flaps running the full length of the trailing edge from the aileron towards the wing root. Let's have a closer look at the cockpit. It is set quite high and ground visibility in the P-40 was quite poor. To open, the canopy slides backwards. This can be done by hand or from the inside via a crank. This crank can also be accessed from the outside via a starboard latch in case the canopy was locked close. Have a closer look at the glazing behind the pilot. This is the improved visibility modification followed on from the P-40N5 model. In this aircraft, the pilot sits on top of two fuel tanks. The forward fuel tank holds 34 gallons, the aft 54 gallons. An additional fuel tank is located in the fuselage, holding 66 gallons. Optional drop tanks of 75 or 150 gallons could be mounted centerline below the pilot or outside of the gear for long-range ferry missions. The pilot himself is protected by a 3 8 of an inch armor plate in front of his instruments and a 5 16 inch armor plate behind him. The head armor was sometimes augmented by an additional 5 16 inch plate. A quarter of an inch deflector plates to the sides of his seat also increased his protection. The armored windscreen is one and a half inches thick. Moving along the upper side of the fuselage, we find the aerial mast. The two indentations on either side are probably the mounting points for the IFF aerials running to the tailplane. However, this would signify an older IFS system and not the British Mark III, that being the US SCR 695 IFF that should be on this model of aircraft based on the manual. It is possible that in the theater a change was made or that during restoration a piece from another aircraft was used to cover up this portion of the exhibit, but that is speculation. Moving aft, the oxygen tank would be stored in the rear part of the aircraft. You will find more maintenance panels. On the top, you have access to the electric wiring and a small cover plate can be disconnected to find the aft lifting point. Parallel to this, additional panels allow access to the tail wheel and the rudder control system. Speaking of the tail wheel, here we have it. The tail wheel can swivel and is retractable. Originally, it would be 12.5 inch fire stones. When retracting, a piston above the wheel moves forward, pulling the oleo strut and thus lifting the drag truss by about 60 degrees. Thus, the wheel swings up and backwards while the doors get pulled close. The tailplane is simple and you can actually see the balance control of the canvas covered elevator due to the square shaped cut into the tailplane. The trim tabs are clearly visible as are the small rods that set the trim deflection based on pilot input. The rudder hooks slightly into the vertical stabilizer and you will find a navigational light here as well. The yaw trim and yaw control rod can be found on the lower half. On the port side, you can also see an access door for the rudder hinge. Continuing on the port side, below the tailplane, you will find additional access doors that mirror the functionality of the doors found on the other side or allow further access. Halfway back towards the cockpit, the hydraulic tank access and the main fuselage access door. This one hinges upwards and allows access to all the systems behind the main fuel tank, such as the radio transmitter and receiver or the oxygen supply. A starter crank and survival equipment would also be stored here. There is a recognition light next to the aerial mast. Below the cockpit canopy, a handhold to pull yourself up onto the wing and the fuel filler caps. The port wing is similar to the starboard one and I will only point out the main differences. However, because this is a restoration, there seem to be a couple of things missing. First of all, there are no recognition lights on the lower side of the wing root and there is no small peg that would usually deploy with the flaps to give an indication of the deflection 
On the aileron, you will find the uh, trim control rod again and the hinge inspection doors. Red navigational lights can be found on the upper and lower side. The pitot tube can also be found near the wingtip on the leading edge. And then of course there's a landing light, retractable and currently in the stored position. Now let's have a closer look at the gear as promised. The main bubble fairing is set below the wing and is actually attached rather than being part of the original wing construction. Original wheels would be 27 inch Hanes with hydraulically operated brakes. Here you can see the Oleo strut and piston as well as the scissor links. Retraction is simple and a straight rearward swing. During this, the strut rotates by 96 degrees. This allows the gear to swing into the gear well unobstructed, and the doors close by being pulled inwards during the retraction. At the wing root, you will sometimes find a small hole for the gun camera. On the port side of the engine cowling, we have the external power receptacle. You can also find the quarter turn fasteners here that will allow easy dismantling of the cowling for engine access. Also notice the port filler air intake and, in case you haven't seen it yet, the shark mouth paint scheme we often associate with P40s, although in actual fact many P40 squadrons did not use it. So let's talk about the history of this specific aircraft found at the RAF Museum. A lot of effort went into establishing the object's history and I'm pulling this straight from the museum's own research. This aircraft itself served in the South Pacific Theater during 1944. During the restoration, a few different plane parts had to be combined into this one to make it a static display, with some replica parts added where nothing original could be salvaged. However, the fuselage's identity could be confirmed as being a P-40N-15. In total, over 377 N-15 models were built. This aircraft served under the serial 829-556 with the Royal Australian Air Force and flew with number 80 squadron around New Britain and covered the landings at Hollandia. Flying between March 1944 to May 1944, it was damaged in a landing accident and later damaged again from unknown causes, slotting it to be converted to components, which essentially means that the aircraft was supposed to be cannibalized for spare parts. Between recovery and restoration by an American team, around 20 years had passed and the aircraft arrived in the UK in 1992. Although not accurate to the plane's origins, the aircraft currently bears the markings of No. 112 Squadron and Kitty Hawk FX760 GA question mark. And before you ask, yes, that is historically accurate. This aircraft operated in Italy in June 1944. Number 112 Squadron is also reported to be the first Allied P-40 Squadron to have used the Shark Mouth logo, becoming the Shark Squadron and also retaining this look with their later P-51s. After this conversion to the Mustangs, FX-760 moved to number 3 Squadron Royal Australian Air Force. There it was shot down by anti-aircraft fire in August 1944. As such, the history of two aircraft was combined in this static display. So I hope that you enjoyed this look at the P-40 found at the RAF Museum. If you did, please consider supporting the channel via Patreon or channel memberships. This allows me to travel to these museums to film and of course by sharing this video. I'd also like to thank the RAF Museum for the great access they gave me on this machine. Consider checking out their own YouTube channel. And as always, have a great day and see you in the sky.